and now it's straight facts I don't lie in my raps, Hunter Biden smoke The Democrats know that, Biden ain't win jack The name is Barack, he a little B like the pack The earth might be flat Ho ho ho, we're back Andrew says, I wouldn't lie to you, except for maybe this one. I'm, I'm kind of free, free to be who I want to be, I guess. We're bringing back the podcast. Um, will there be a show? Who knows? Maybe in the future. Right now, we're writing, we're pontificating, we're predicting everything still that always happens in the world. And I'm going to go over just the most ridiculous stories. Stuff that I couldn't talk about before, probably. I couldn't really be myself, say exactly what I wanted, but I'm a bit more free now. I'm still not going to go off the deep end, don't worry. Or maybe I should just say that so you'll keep listening. Um, But this is going to be great. I get to talk about the things that make me laugh the most. You know, I was never the most serious guy. So me having to sit there and be like, hmm, where can I find, you know, the hard-hitting news story in this? Uh, Which is, you know, I I couldn't just go and be like, hey, Leo and Danny Mullen, um... Just go and say whatever you want. Danny Mullen asked to see my penis one time. So I somehow have to warp that into like, hey, how is this actually about the news? <laughs> so I just want to go over the most ridiculous things that I find on the internet through my writing, usually through my interneting, usually. Let's just get right into it and we'll see how this goes for everybody. The first thing that I want to talk about is one of the most hilarious stories of all time. It's called The White Supremacist Origins of Exercise and Six Other Surprising Facts About U.S. History. (laughs) The History of U.S. Physical Fitness. So right off the bat, this is Time Magazine. You know it's going to be good. You know it's going to be hard-hitting. I feel like I'm sitting off to one side, but that's fine if it's audio. Nobody knows. Now, this article might have a few points. It probably does about, you know, the fitness industry. You know how I feel about CrossFit. I made some people angry the other day saying that it sucks. But the article isn't titled, you know, how the U.S. fitness industry is a scam or how they improperly got people to be unhealthy with their diets or anything like that. No, it's about white supremacy. And of course, the first thing you're going to find in this article is the girl saying that by 1920 standards, I'm attractive. (laughs) That's the first thing they go for every time. Quote, what would be considered today fat or bigger was actually desirable and actually signified affluence, which is like the polar opposite of today. That's in the quote, which is like, is actually in the quote. Now that made me think 20 years from now, are they, getting, are they totally just using what's happening now as a precursor to 20 years from now to say, Hey, in 2022, 23, we were, you know, men turning into women, transgender women were considered attractive. Are are you saying that me looking like a guy is not attractive? <laughs> so that's how the, the standard, the Overton window is going to get pushed a little bit, I think. Um, perhaps unseriously. Maybe I'm serious. The next thing she talked about, by the way, was running. And of course, this is just completely racist. She says that access was never totally equal to running. Going outside and running, doesn't matter where you are, it was never equal. Um, What does she say here? If you lived in a neighborhood that didn't have safe streets or streets that were not well lit, you couldn't go running. So you can't run inside, you can't run at at a baseball field or a track or something. If you don't have safe streets, then you're screwed. You'll never be able to exercise. And she says the idea that exists that everyone can run is forgetting the fact that depending on where you live and the body that you live in, it can be a very different kind of experience. Yeah, I'm out of shape, so my running experience is not going to be that fun. It's funny because each and everything, and it gets even more ridiculous, we're going to get to 9-11. <laughs> we're going to get to Richard Simmons. But each thing where they're tr- trying to be like, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of, of leeway here in the point. Then it just goes straight off the deep end. Oh, it's white supremacy. Actually, being fat is great. So the idea that everyone can run forgets the fact that I'm fat. <laughs> Here's where it gets really weird, though. Pre and post World War II, apparently, was a scam for fitness. Um, she blamed the idea that, you know, the President of the United States and uh, the Prime Minister of England saying that you should be in shape is, you know, just a ploy to get you to defend your country. And to that, you know, this is one of those points where you're just like, okay, that kind of makes sense. They obviously would want people to be in shape 
to fight Nazis and communists and fascists. But then you sort of think, yeah, why wouldn't you? Like, why would you not encourage your countrymen to be in shape in case another war breaks out or because a war is breaking out and you're going to have to fight it? No matter what you think about the war, if a world war is happening, you would prefer your people not be fat. It's an obvious problem that a country in a war would have. Imagine it now. I mean, you don't really have to imagine it. The transgender admiral, you know, uh, whiteness is a problem in the military. It's not a good time to be in the military, I would imagine. sitting. I sat through a lot of shit classes in the army, but none of them were just like hate yourself or like love transgender people and... There weren't any transgender people in the army when I was in there. Just saying. Um, it gets even weirder, of course. Post-9-11 fitness is a category she pointed to. Now, I'm sitting here thinking that, like, there was no thing after 9-11 that was just like, you must be in shape. But she calls it militarized fitness and girding yourself and body for a fight. Now, I guess this would be kind of along the lines of the World War II stuff, but it's not like everybody was saying you have to go sign up and fight in Iraq. They might have said it's a patriotic thing to do, but there was a draft in World War II. It's not the same at all. So 9-11 is also to blame for white supremacy and fitness, and it gets even worse. Um, 80s fitness. Now, this is wild. This the, I want to reiterate that these are not my words. The 80s fitness boom was... Um, was basically because of AIDS, she says. And she says that gay men exercise to look healthy so that people didn't accuse them of having AIDS. (laughs) She said that she spoke to a few gay, gay men who, quote, exercised to display that they had a healthy body at a moment when there was so much homophobia. This is what this girl thinks. Who is she talking to? And here's the one, this this is how you know she's completely full of it. This is how you know. Lockdowns accelerated fitness inequality, remarking that, that not everyone can go home and be on their Peloton. <laughs> so because not everybody has a $3,000 Peloton and subscription, there's no way that anybody can, ha- can exercise. There's no push-ups. Uh, maybe you don't have stairs, you can't run. Maybe you don't have a backyard, you can't exercise in. Don't have a basement. If you don't have a Peloton, then things are unfair. This is the most, <laughs> this is the the basis of the argument, isn't it? I'm not rich, therefore you can't have anything. And this somehow all filters down. It all gets poured down in the same thing, you know, like hating rich people, the racism's in there of, uh, of everybody who, you know, she doesn't like, I guess. Um, World War II, for some reason, 9-11, and then... I don't know, weird, weird stuff about gay people in the eighties and then not having a Peloton (laughs) apparently, um, is the worst thing in the world. And you can't exercise if you don't have one. She then gets into something that she does like finally at the end of this interview time magazine, by the way, wild. I used to think that, uh, remember in like 2016 when everything started being like, Oh, actually we're political time magazine, Rolling Stone. Maybe they always were, but you remember things like time magazine is not being, Something that pushed propaganda down your throat. But then again, who knows? Maybe in the 80s, Time Magazine was telling you to work out so that people don't think you're sick. Which is an odd thing for anyone to have the position of. But she likes Richard Simmons for some reason. And she says, we should not presume because that, because you're fat that you're not fit. Yes, you should. I'm telling you. I consider myself currently fat. <laughs> I have relatives who are fat. None of them have ever said they're in shape or fit. You're just not. What does fit mean? (laughs) You don't fit into things. That's why you're unfit. She says that don't let any, (laughs) we should not presume that because you're fat that you are not fit or that you want to lose weight. That's wild in itself. And then she says, and I think that we probably couldn't have had that without Richard Simmons. What? (laughs) I may be fat, but don't you dare think that I want to lose weight. And I'm also fit, by the way. Why would you want to lose weight if you're fit? That doesn't make any sense. None of this makes any sense. And that's why I love being able to just talk freely about stuff that doesn't make any sense. This next story. Oh, my God. 
It's about a women's bar in Seattle. It, that being a bar that only shows women's sports. Um, they sort of backtrack amongst their press coverage. Like they started off with their announcement in the summer of 2022. Tons of press. We're only going to show women's sports. Then they launch in December 2022 and they're like, we're going to prioritize women's sports. How quickly they've changed. But it's a women's bar. I forget what it's called. Um, and on the surface, I don't really have a problem with it. Go get your money. Make your business. I watch a lot of Shark Tank. I watch a lot of Bar Rescue. Kitchen Nightmare, stuff like that. Go get your money. Be an entrepreneur. I support you in that. Um, they're very predictable, though. Celebrating Brittany Griner for getting out of jail. Uh, marriage equality. We'll look past that, even though the point there is that marriage equality, you could already get have gay marriage. Um, Brittany Griner's not a great person. She was traded for an arms dealer. She didn't want to stand for the national anthem. She wanted them to remove it from the WNBA. All this stuff. We're going to look past that. I'll even... Look past the fact on their website it says we want equal pay in not just sports but in everything, which makes no sense. Either or makes no sense. But I, this is just one of the most hilarious origin stories for anything. This owner is going to become a super villain, villain, I guarantee it. Local Seattle radio station uh, KNKX reported on the launch showcasing the local professional teams that will be promoted at the bar. In particular, they mention a women's football team, which they claim has been around for 20 years and they have been have a winning record, but still almost no people know that they exist. <laughs> so they're promoting this bar and these sports teams and immediately they admit that nobody knows this teams exist. Uh, exists. And it's the first team they mention. Uh, then, then they start talking with this uh, soccer player, Kat Morizano. She plays for the team O.L. Reign. Um, I don't know what that means, but Reign is spelled R-E. IGN. She told the radio station that she had trouble finding a venue that would put her team's game on its screens. Okay. She says, I got so much backlash just for asking them to play the game. And I think that's insane. And it was a regular sports bar. Why would nobody want to play a women's professional soccer team on their TV in their bar where men are drinking and and watching sports? I mean, honestly, though, it, it forces you to be mean, but name five... Andrew, name 10 sports off the top of your head you'd rather watch than women's professional soccer. NBA, UFC, NHL, MLB, NFL, English soccer, Formula One, um, darts, 140. Um, Rugby, I'd rather watch. Um, One more, can we go one more? I mean, I could go lower leagues, like junior hockey I would rather watch. Um, you know, uh, I'd rather watch the hundred meter men's sprint. I'd rather watch the women's 100 meter sprint upwards to 400 meters than women's professional soccer. Cause it's just not good. It, it's just not, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, the more, the story gets more and more hilarious. She is on this Morizano girl. She is on the same team as Megan Rapinoe. You remember her? Um, the woman who's like, equal pay, everything's racist, Trump is sexist and anti-gay, USA, go away. That woman, she campaigned for the equal pay of the Olympic soccer team, who obviously took in less than 10% uh, percent of the men's. And also on this team is a girl who just goes by Quinn. She's a Canadian, so we claim her. Um, she's non-binary and she's a woman, but she goes by just Quinn, like she's Brazilian, and if you go to their website, this team soccer website, they have the whole roster listed like every sports team does. She's the only one who has pronouns that aren't, you know, she, her, but they all have them listed. So you've got like 20 girls or something. They all have she, her, except for her, who's a they, them. That's, again, the argument goes against itself about like all this stuff. You know, everything has to be changed on this website just to, you know... Uh, just to support this one person, everything's got to change to orbit their being. Everybody's got two names. She's going by one. Everybody's got this, no pronouns different from normal. She's got to have it on there. So this is all the same team. And the best thing that really wraps this story together after this Kat Morizano woman said that she came to this bar because nobody would play the game of the team that she's on, on TV the owner of the bar says the exact same thing. Her origin story 
uh, here I'll read it for you. Owner Jen's ba- Jen Barnes found herself unable to find a venue that would play an OL rain game in full when broadcast at the same time as the Seattle Seahawks game. So she goes around. She fa- she's trying to find a um, bar that will play a w- women's playoff soccer game, and none of them would play it except for one who said that as soon as the football game comes on, they're going to change the channel. So she creates a bar, and the first person to come in the bar is a woman from the soccer team who can't get anybody to play her team's game. So this whole time, nobody will watch this woman's game from her soccer team, even though it's the most popular team there is for women's soccer with the most popular women's soccer player and the other non-binary girls. So they've got everything going that they want. They've got equality. They've got their team. They've got the woman who stands up for equal pay for their team. They've got a non-binary girl, so they're incredibly inclusive. They've got their own bar, but nobody knows who they are, isn't <laughs> I mean, I'm starting to sound mean, but somebody's got to talk about this stuff. Somebody's got to tell you how stupid it really is out there. Um, but we wish them all the best. <laughs> the last thing I want to talk about is how electric cars are races. Hear me out. This is another self-fulfilling fulfilling prophecy. I don't know if all the stories are always going to be like this. So very self-fulfilling. But they might be. And they probably will be. Because I got really good at this thing where I read a story and I'm he- headlined in one sentence in. Maybe just the image in. And I can predict what's going to happen in the story. And in this story, you know that electric cars are going to be racist because why? You fill in the blank right now and you let me know if you're right. And you probably are if you watch or listen to enough of me. Global ecological crisis is simultaneously a racial justice crisis. Racial justice, everybody. So... This woman who works for the UN, she's leaving. She's caused quite a stir before she has many times. Um, She's complaining that climate change is disproportionately affecting, you know, people she deems to be lesser, which is the reality of it. She's going to say certain races or something, but it's all around the world. So it's hard for her to pinpoint this working for the UN because it's not just localized in America or England, for example. So she says racial injustice all over the world. And we'll get to how she thinks that first or excuse me in a second, but she says that not only is there inequalities coming from climate change, the solutions to climate change are also racially charged and cause injustice to minorities and poor people. So on one hand, she's saying, you know, climate change is making poor people poor and sick, but then the solutions are also making people poor and sick. So you're not supposed to make things that I disapprove of or else, you know, you're going to have to, I'm going to have to write an article about you or make an announcement is what she did, a a decree. So what she's saying is, is not only is the climate change bad for the people she deems it to be bad for, but the way that they're mining and building the stuff like electric cars is also done in a racist manner somehow. Now I looked into this, two of the top four producers of lithium for electric car batteries are Argentina and Australia. I want to know who they're being racist to. The Argentinians who recently had their soccer team called, you know, too white, even though it's 97% like Hispanic white people. They What do they call them? A white Latino or li- whatever it's called. But they're all the same race. And then Australians are predominantly Australians stemming from British colonies, right? But they're saying that the, the way they're mining the lithium subjugate somehow or is is mean to (laughs) the people who live near them fine so you're saying you can't even mine the stuff to make it better we're also going to demand that you farm and mine and build a different way so on one hand she's saying hey you got to do something to fix this climate change but then she says the way you're fixing the climate change is also racist so you need to mine build and spend all the money the way that i want to so i can then call you racist if you do not because it, it she she's doing it all across the world she's condemning people all across the world so it's hard for her to say you know that um you know um, black americans are suffering or, or white germans or indian people are suffering in this country she's saying that the people in their very own country are being racist to their very own people and i look up the ethnic makeups of this and where the minds are at and it's just not true so it's a very lazy argument where you're just saying, Hey, this is racist. Uh, how is it racist? Um, there's 
they're treating people poorly. But this is in Argentina where everybody's pretty much the same skin tone and I think background. No, it's still it's still racist. She says the same structures responsible for the racial inequalities are, quote, doubling down on racial inequality and injustice. So it's much injustice going on here. Governing bodies are not accounting for the environmental impact of electric vehicles and where the minerals of all the materials that are required to produce electric vehicles are coming from. And her name is something to me. I apologize. I didn't not include her first name on purpose. But she's got this insane history of calling everything racist. 2020. Brexit, racist. Britain leaving the EU. 2022, World Cup, racist. But only against South Asians and Africans. <laughs> so she said the migrant workers they they brought in, even though they're from all, the, all around the world, they were only racist to South Asians and Africans, not Europeans, um, not Arabs, not Australians, but only South Asians and sub-Saharan Africans. So specifically the Qataris, they only specifically like or dislike Indians and people from, you know, uh, the China region. And uh, although I know Chinese people went there to, to work, but only specifically races against that region and sub-Saharan Africans. So people who are south of the, of the, the Sahara, yes. <laughs> so very specific racism. Um, she also said that Morocco is racist internally, and then she said that the Netherlands is racist because, get this, they believe that they're not racist. <laughs> she says that um, the Netherlands holds this belief that it's equal and tolerant, um, and it's false. It's a false idea in the Dutch society that it is equal and tolerant, which operates as a barrier to achieving this equality and tolerance. So you thought that you were equal and tolerant country? Actually, no, it's your equality and tolerance beliefs that are unequal and intolerant. Do you see how all of this works? I think you do. Thank you for watching. This is the first one. We might be longer next time. Who knows? I just ramble on until I make myself laugh. Remember, I wouldn't lie to you, except for maybe this once. I'm lying right now.